Hi, welcome to my channel. My name is Emmy, and on today's video, we're going to talk about how to make gold by joining a Living World Season 4 meta train. The Living World system is a series of updates added after official expansions to continue the story and provide more open world content. In this video, we'll be talking about the different maps in the Season 4 set of Living World episodes. The train that hits each of these maps is known as the Living World Season 4 meta train, or LS4 train for short. We'll start with the explanations on the specific types of currencies and why they're valuable, then we'll talk about how to maximize your loot by running a tagging build with appropriate boosters, and then we'll go through each map encounter so you know exactly what to look for. Living World Season 4 maps have a collective wallet currency known as Volatile Magic. This currency can be traded with various merchants throughout the map for shipments of crafting materials, including highly valuable trophies. Spending time in the maps and doing events will naturally generate volatile magic, but specific events have high concentrations of enemy spawns and loot chests. You can check which conversion of volatile magic is the most profitable by looking at dedicated Gilwars 2 websites, such as the research done at Pew's Research Center. In addition, we'll talk about various buffs that will compound the amount of karma, experience, and gold you generate. Karma can be used to get affordable gear or it can be converted to gold, and the spirit shards generated from experience gain can increase the value of your materials through Mystic Forge recipes. Finally, the events are programmed to scale up as more players are within range. This means that the density and the rarity of enemies will increase as more players join the fight. With a sufficient number of people, enemies of champion or legendary status will begin appearing. These high rarity enemies will drop champion loot bags, which contain a variety of crafting materials and account bound currencies. These enemies die slower since they have larger health pools, but with over 50 people railing on them, it's a good idea to keep an eye out specifically for the champion tag in front of the enemy's name. I want to include a note that this train is profitable in terms of in-game currency while also being dynamic and interesting. Since this train hits the naturally spawning events throughout a variety of different maps, it means that you're genuinely playing the game, simply in a more optimized way. Instead of brute force farming a single area over and over, I have found the train to be very enjoyable since other players in the train are very friendly and talkative, and you get to enjoy the different scenery in different regions of the desert. It can be a great way to meet other players in a casual environment, and you can get to know some of the well-known guilds that enjoy open world theory crafting and research. This train can be done by anyone on any class with any level of experience. It's one of the great things about it. There's very little pressure to gear a specific character since anyone can profit simply by doing the events. However, there are some builds that excel at tagging enemies, tagging being defined as doing enough damage to a target to get kill credit. Enemies in this train tend to die quickly since there are many players attempting to get tags. Thus, it can be helpful to equip a long range weapon with area of effect skills. Great examples include a shortbow thief, which has an auto attack that bounces between enemies with a range of 900, and a staff necromancer, which has four large area of effect skills with a range of 1200. These two builds are my go-to options for this train, since they have a lot of safety, mobility, range, and area of effect, and I'll include a link to tagging builds in the description below. For all of the other classes, my recommendations include Greatsword Mesmer, Staff Elementalist, Longbow Ranger, Flamethrower Engineer, Staff Guardian, Shortbow Revenant, and Rifle Warrior. No matter which class you're playing, you want to make sure that you have on boosters. Boosters that I run include the Experience Booster, which increases total experience gain and access to bonus experience from killstreaks. The Item Booster, which increases magic find and chance of gathering extra materials. The Karma Booster, which increases karma gain from events and enemy kills. And the Celebration Booster, which increases experience, magic find, and gold generation from kills. Optionally, you can use a Black Lion booster purchasable with Black Lion statuettes, but I like to save my statuettes for pretty skins, so I personally don't. If you have it, you can also use the Candy Corn Gobbler to trade Candy Corn for all of the boosters except for the Black Lion one. In addition to boosters, there are other ways to increase these various stats. Hero and Spirit Banners placed by guilds are stationary objects that provide buffs to those that interact with them, and Ascended Food increases your base stats as well as magic find, experience, and gold generation. Cheap utility, notably the Halloween utility consumables, provide a large amount of magic find and experience gain. If you're in a guild, you can speak with the guild bartender to get a free enhancement for a stat of your choice, and ascended amulets can be used to hold an enrichment item. Communal bonfires can be purchased by generous players from the gem store, and New Year fireworks can be purchased from the trading post for a small amount of silver. If you plan to visit the Living World maps frequently, the Karma and Experience enhancements purchasable from the Volatile Magic Vendor are a worthwhile investment. 
They will cost an upfront amount of gold and volatile magic, but they are permanent upgrades for that map. There are 3 tiers and 6 regions, so a total of 18 upgrades can be purchased. Before we start with explanations, it's worth noting that different commanders will prioritize slightly different events. For example, some commanders might hit bounties between the main meta events, whereas other commanders might do smaller stuff instead. In addition, depending on whether it's currently daylight savings, commanders might start at different metas and loop around. No matter which type of train you end up joining, all of the information still applies, just maybe in a different order. To join a group, I recommend joining the Overflow Trading Company Discord, which is a major hub for players interested in gold generation techniques. On the NA Mega server, commanders run this train daily around 30 minutes after reset. The first map in the train typically begins at nighttime in front of Palawadan in the Domain of Istan, which is the first episode in the Living World Season 4 series. This event takes place right as nighttime begins, and throughout the meta event, the goal is to capture the rally points while thinning out the awakened forces. At each rally point, at least two or three champion enemies will spawn, so it's important to get kill credit so you can guarantee yourself a champion loot bag. Having survivability will help a lot here, since these champion enemies often have a large health pool and hard hitting mechanics. After each point has been successfully captured, supply stashes will spawn at predetermined locations inside buildings, along the streets, or next to structures. I won't go over each location, but veteran players will often make a beeline towards stash locations, so simply following the flow of your squad will likely get you the majority of the stashes. They also show up on your minimap as a chest icon. One thing to note during this meta is the ship sinking phase. It can be overwhelming since there's a lot of enemies and allies running around, but if you have a flying mount or an enhanced skimmer, head directly for the ships to get kill credit on more champion enemies. Many veteran and elite enemies will be swarming the land areas during this time, so if you don't have a way to get onto the ship, I recommend heading towards the wooden docks to act as the revive team. Players that down in the water or on the ship will automatically be teleported to this location, so you can get experience from reviving other players while simultaneously staying huddled with your allies. For whatever reason, if you fully die, it is always recommended to waypoint and run back, since reviving someone from full death is dangerous and time-consuming. The last event in this meta involves killing the Awakened Archon Ibero. After the ships have been sunk, players will likely take a few moments to loot the supply chest that spawn, and then head north towards the circular arena. This boss's primary mechanic happens at 75% and 25%, where breaking the defiance bar will interrupt the circular pool. After all of the events related to the Palawadan raid have been completed, the commander will likely start calling out bounties or events to complete while waiting for the next meta event, which happens at daybreak. Always be watching your chat for waypoint links and try to get credit for as many events as you can. After a short amount of time, the next meta event in the Domain of Istan will begin, which is the Assault on the Great Hall. This meta event is fairly intuitive, and supply stashes will spawn as events are successfully completed. The final event is a battle with Amala, who will change forms as she loses health. At each quarter of health, so 100%, 75%, 50%, and 25%, champion enemies will spawn near the edges of the arena. Make sure you tag and get kill credit for these champions since they will drop champion loot bags. Once the Great Hall meta has finished, commanders will likely move towards Thunderhead Peaks, which is the fifth episode in the Living World Season 4 series. During the winter months, this is where the train will begin. Towards the southern end of this map, the Oil Flows meta event will trigger at the 45 minute mark. The squad will need to divide into three groups since three oil drills spread across the map will need simultaneous protection. After a brief escort phase, the oil protection phase will begin. Champion Hydras will spawn at each of the three locations and begin dealing damage to the oil drill. If the drill's health reaches zero, the meta will fail, so it is extremely important that each drill has sufficient number of players and that the Hydra is killed within a reasonable amount of time. After the champion has died, another event will spawn at each of the drill locations. This event is a unique one, where you need to use your special action key to collect the splotches of black oil on the ground. If you've never used your special action key before, it is a keybind that appears during certain events that has a different function depending on the encounter. I highly recommend rebinding the key to something that's easy to reach, since many open world events and instance content will require special action key usage. For myself personally, I use tab. The final event in this chain is the oil slug solo picks. This boss is quite slippery. With the full squad, it shouldn't be too difficult to successfully kill him, but do your best to do damage while slipping around. After the boss dies, make sure you harvest the gathering nodes that spawn in the oil pit. After Solipix has been killed, you'll be moving to Jahai Bluffs, the fourth episode of the Living World Season 4 series. 
As you spawn into this map, it is likely that the primary escort event, Escort the Dervs, has already begun. In this event, it is important to stay near the NPCs to keep them alive while simultaneously keeping an eye out for champion enemies that spawn. The escort event's conclusion will lead to the beginning of the Death Branded Shatterer boss. The Shatterer itself is a large crystal dragon with several phases at 75%, 50%, and 25% where champion Rift Sulkers will spawn. These champions need to be killed or the Shatterer will remain invulnerable. It's worth mentioning that these Rift Sulkers will drop champion loot bags, so it's in everyone's best interest to get kill credit. Keep in mind that in the final quarter of the boss's health, he will spawn three champions at three different locations. You don't have a mount to quickly move from one side to another, you can either take the tornado to spin up into the air, or you can take the launch platform to go between sides. After completing the Shatterer boss, it's likely that your commander will spend some time navigating the map towards branded incursion events, which spawn between random preset locations on the map. These incursions appear inside of mirage-like domes and spawn many branded enemies that drop loot, experience, and if you have the karmic empowerment, karma. Try to stay with the group and take out the incursion bosses one at a time so everyone can get kill credit as you rotate around the dome. After killing time by doing the incursions, another large event will spawn in Thunderhead Peaks, this time on the northern side of the map. The Thunderhead Keep meta will begin as soon as the gates open towards the courtyard with branded swarming the area. Stay close to your squad and move together at the same time so everyone can maximize the number of enemies they tag. I have typically seen commanders move towards the right side of the gate and swirl around counterclockwise. After all of the enemies have been cleared from the area, an intermittent phase will begin. To progress this event, players need to make sure enough mines are placed in the choke points. To quickly deploy mines, stay on a fast moving landmount and toggle your special action key after running past Kanak in the center of the courtyard. When enough mines have been deployed, enemies will start pouring into the choke points. There will be a lot of champion rarity enemies, so make sure to attack them to get credit for your champion loot bag. One final set of champion enemies will spawn on both sides of both choke points, and successfully killing them will trigger the Wrathbringer boss in the center of the courtyard. To effectively deal with Wrathbringer, make sure you've picked up some spears to enable your special action key. Wrathbringer is invulnerable to damage when shielded by crystal, and only your special action key attacks will remove the shielding. In addition, the boss will have several large conical and spherical attacks which can be difficult to avoid depending on where you're positioned. Having defensive skills and buffs such as block, invulnerability, stability, protection, and barrier will help you survive these attacks. The next stop in the train will be Sandswept Isles, the second episode of the Living World Season 4 series. The Gathering Storms and Specimen Chamber meta events are not typically on a scheduled timer and instead spawn dynamically in both the northern and southern areas of the map. Depending on which event is available at the time, your commander will direct you towards the northern waypoint near the docks or the southern waypoint near the inquest. We'll cover the northern series of events first, known as the Gathering Storms meta. The event starts with four different locations of elemental enemies. After killing a group of enemies, the counter on the event notification will decrease by one, and it is likely that your commander will be using Griffin or Skyscale to quickly reach the next point. If you don't have a flying mount, take your time and use your land-based mounts to reach your squad. The groups of enemies take a decent amount of time to kill, so there should be enough time for you to get credit, even if you arrive late. Once you're at the location of the elementals, do your best to deal damage while the untargetable tornado pulls you towards the center. In addition, try to stay alive. Your player model will still be pulled towards the tornado even when downed, so it's very difficult for your allies to revive you without risking death themselves. Once all of the elementals have been cleared out, the next event will spawn slightly north of the Althoma waypoint. This time, you'll need to escort a pair of NPCs towards the final boss. Many normal and champion enemies will spawn, so tag as many enemies as you can to maximize the number of champion loot bags you get. Finally, the meta event will end when Zohakan is defeated in his lair. This fight is fairly straightforward. The only thing I would recommend is to time your Springer's dismount skill to break the boss's Defiance Bar at the start of the fight. There is a brief moment before the Defiance Bar appears, so stay still until you see the bar turn blue. The southern series of events are known as the Specimen Chamber meta. This event is fairly straightforward, but it is extremely profitable due to the high number of enemies. The first event in the series is a 5 minute capture event that spawns literally hundreds of enemies over its duration. Range area of effect skills are important here, since the enemies will spawn between three predetermined locations around the main capture area. I recommend staying close to the center and placing long range area of effect skills that tick damage over time in the choke points. This will minimize the amount of time you waste when moving between sections. It is also much safer since you won't be in the middle of enemies that spawn at once. 
Once the capture event has been completed, two randoms will be chosen from a pool of six possible bosses. In the first phase, one of the two bosses will appear. In the second phase, the second of the two bosses will appear. In the final phase, both bosses will appear at the same time and both will be vulnerable. Successfully killing the bosses will conclude the event. Some commanders choose to end in Sands of Dials, other commanders choose to go one map further into the domain of Korna, the third episode in the Living World Season 4 series. The meta event in this map, containing the Scarab Plague, is technically on a timed rotation. However, the events leading up to the main fight are often long and take a variable amount of time. Your commander will likely search for a map that has already completed the first two events in the event chain and skip directly to the phase where the cannons need to be reprogrammed. In order to successfully reprogram the cannons, the squad needs to split up into three groups to protect each cannon simultaneously, similar to the concept in the Oil Flows meta. Once the cannons have been reprogrammed, waypoint back to the Allied Encampment waypoint to take a Mesmer portal next to one of the buildings. This is especially helpful for newer players that might not have completely explored the map. This Mesmer portal will take you outside of the fortress where you and your allies need to capture various points spread around the front gate. Make sure you manually loot the chests that spawn. You don't need any keys for them, but the auto loot will not pick them up. After a short fight with an Asura and his golem, and after destroying the research evidence, the event will complete and an access key will be deposited into your inventory. Interacting with this access key will allow you to portal into the final loot area. That's all of the events typically covered in the Living World Season 4 train. You might have noticed that we only talked about 5 out of the 6 maps, and the final episode located in Dragonfall is missing. This is because the Dragonfall map itself is the stage for an enormous map-wide series of events that's usually farmed separately from the other Living World episodes. That's all I have for this video. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider liking, subscribing, or commenting to tell me what you think. I'm also an ArenaNet partner and I stream quite regularly on Twitch, so if you have any questions that you like answered, feel free to swing by and say hi. Thank you very much for watching all the way to the end. I'll see you in the next video.